Boom. You see up on the board, we have uh, this scripture. In fact, I saw that on the board Sunday, didn't you? Since by your obedience to the truth through the Holy Spirit. That's what I want to talk about tonight, the Holy Spirit. Because notice what it says. Since by your obedience to the truth through the Holy Spirit. Everything that we have to do, we have to do in the power of the Holy Spirit. And we have to learn to do that. But I want you to turn now, if you will, to verse 23. Put verse 23 up there. So the first job the Holy Spirit uh, has done in our lives, as far as we know, is that he caused us to be born again. So let's read that up on the board. Verse 23. For you, for have you... Be- you have been regenerated, born again, not from a mortal origin, seed, or sperm, but from one that is immortal by every living and lasting word of God. I want to read that again. You have been regenerated or born again, not from a mortal origin, seed, or a sperm, but from one that is immortal. By the ever-living and lasting Word of God. I have an acorn here. Everybody see that little acorn I got right here? That's a small thing. How many have seen the big oak on the, on the hill up there? Everybody have seen the big oak? Can we believe that that started from a little seed like that? A little seed like that. Everything that you see in that oak out there was in a little seed like this. Let's just suppose this, a plant here is a real plant. It looks real. Started from perhaps a little seed. So all of this that you see right there was in a little seed. Isn't that amazing? We've been born again by the incorruptible seed, the Word of God. The Word of God was that seed that was planted into us. And all that we'll ever be is in that little seed. And so as we nurture it, as it grows and matures, we come into the image of what that little, what's in that little seed. And that's Christ Himself. Christ in our heart is our only hope of glory. So when we put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, we confess with our mouth that He is our Savior and our Lord, and we believe in our heart that God has raised Him from the dead, and we believe that and accept Him as our Savior, the Holy Spirit then takes that word and and, uh, causes our spirit to be born again. And now we're conscious of God. You may work with people, that's not been born again by the incorruptible word of the seed of the word of God. They're not God conscious. They have no consciousness of God. Oh, they may have a mental concept. Oh, yeah, I believe in God. Well, the devils believe in God and tremble. But you know God, we know God, because we've been born again, and our spirits have been regenerated by the word. Of God. That's how powerful the Word of God is. And as all that's in that seed begins to come forth, our spirit man begins to grow into the image of God again, and we're God conscious. Now, as I go back and I remember when I was uh, born again 54 years ago, all I know is that the difference that uh, I experienced from being in the darkness even though I had a consciousness of God in my mind, my spirit was dead towards God. And I could talk about God. I knew scriptures and so forth. But I wasn't born again by the incorruptible seed of the Word of God. But when I was born again, regenerated by the Holy Spirit, I was God conscious. I knew God in my spirit man. Totally different. Okay? So it wasn't not a religious thing. But it was an experience that I had with the Holy Spirit and Christ came into my heart. Now I want you to turn, if you will, over to uh, John 
St. John. And uh, I want to start from uh, chapter thir 13, verse 1. I want to mention something here that I think that's important because I want to talk about the Holy Spirit. Because of Him, we have been born again. Because of the Word of God that He took to cause us to be born again, as He put His power to it, we were born again. Now, chapter 13, verse 1. Right here, God, uh, Jesus is beginning to prepare his disciples for his death. So starting right here in John 13, he begins to talk about him going to Jerusalem and he's going to die on that cross and he begins to teach them some things. And here's what he says in verse 1, chapter 13. Now before the Passover feast began, Jesus knew what was fully aware that the time had come for him to leave this world and return to the Father. Now remember, he was with the Father in the very beginning. 1 John uh, chapter 1, verse 1 tells us that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And as he had loved those who were his own in the world, he loved them to the last, and to the highest decrees. So now as we read this chapter, we come into the understanding that Jesus is preparing his disciples that he's going to die. He had told them sometimes about this, but they did not comprehend. They did not understand until the Holy Spirit made it alive to them. So you'll see that they have uh, the Lord's Supper in this chapter and he washes their feet, and he's teaching them some things now before he goes. Turn real quick to chapter 14, verse 1, and it begins to explain, do not let your hearts be troubled, distressed, agitated. You believe in and heave to and trust in and rely on God. Believe in and heave to and trust and rely also on me. And then he goes on and he's telling his disciples, giving them some some encouraging words about his father's house, and, and he's going to be going there now. And, and I mean, they're at this point, I know they're confused because they're thinking about Jesus conquering the Romans, setting up the kingdom, <clears throat> and, and they're going to have places of authority in his kingdom. This is their, their mindset. <clears throat> so when you read the scriptures, you, 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 this has to come out. You have to understand that. But he's talking about heavenly things now here, and he's talking about he didn't want them to be troubled or distressed. In verse 2, in verse 2, in my Father's house there are many dwelling places, homes. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I am going away to prepare a place for you. Look at verse 3. And when, if I go and make ready a place for you, I will come back again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. But that is not only for those 12 disciples there. Of course, one we know that was Judas, that he didn't make it. But it's also for us. <coughs> so we know that he, he came from the Father, and he was going to go back to the Father. But then he's talking about coming again, and that, uh, that uh, as he goes to the Father, he's going to be preparing places for us. He was in my Father's house are many mansions, many rooms, many homes. And I'm preparing a place for you. And he goes in verse 4 and says, To the place where I am going, you know the way. You know, I don't like to go on a trip and don't know the way, do you? But you know, we're go we are on our way. We are going somewhere. And uh, I thank God for Thomas. And Thomas speaks up and says to him, that's in verse 5, Lord, we do not know where you are going. So how can we know the way? Now you can see by Thomas' speech here that he's all confused. Anybody ever been confused besides me? Absolutely. That's why we have to study to show ourselves approved unto God a workman that needed not to be ashamed. 
but rightly dividing the word of truth. And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me or by me. Now that's, that's an area that we can be very dogmatic on. We might be able to uh, dismiss certain things that people say, but when people say, well, you know, uh, my good works will send me to heaven, that's when we make our stand and we let them know, no, your good works will not guarantee you a place in heaven. The only way you're going to get to heaven is through Jesus Christ. No man goes to the Father except through the Son. <coughs> Excuse me. And then Jesus speaks out and he says in verse 7, If you had known me, had learned to recognize me, you would also have known my Father. From now on you know him and have seen him. Well, this brings more confusion. And then Philip uh, speaks up. He said, <clears throat> Lord, uh, show us the Father. Cause us to see the Father. That is all we ask. Then we shall be satisfied. And Jesus replied, uh, Philip, listen. Have I been with all of you for so long a time? And do not you recognize and know me yet, Philip? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say then, show us the Father? Boy, I love that. If you've seen the Son, you've seen the Father. Christ is in the Father. The Father is in Christ. We're in Christ. We're in the Father. Verse 10, do you not believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? What I am telling you, I do not say on my own authority and of my own accord, but the Father who lives continuously in me does his work, his miracles, deeds of power. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, what we need to see, and I made this discovery so many years ago in my early uh, service to God, I was amazed that everything Jesus did, it was God the Father, by the Holy Spirit, doing it through Jesus. How many of you here have heard me say, what God has done for us, what God is doing in us, that God, that God might do something through us? And I know many times we say, Lord, I want to do this. And I've said that, and I understand that. But we got to come to this place to say, Father, do what you want to do through me. And that's powerful. There's a big difference in us just going ahead and doing things. And a lot of times, we do a lot of things that we don't really need to do. Okay, not scolding nobody. I'm talking about myself too. But I'm saying that there comes a time that you begin to have a real understanding of who lives in you. And that's God the Holy Spirit. And He will guide you and direct you. Now I'm going to say something here that maybe some might not understand. But Susan and me, ever since we've been married, we, and I became a Christian, and, and God began to use us, we never went out to try to do anything. <laughs> it's hard to explain, but God opens doors, and we just walk through them and do it. I'll give you an example. Just recently, this week, my oldest uh, granddaughter, uh, Michelle, called her grandmother and said, Grandma, could you make a fruit basket for this man? This man's wife just passed away. And would you and Grandpa come and talk? Well, I didn't, I didn't create that. I didn't plan that. It was planned for me. It was done. All we did was, she said, Yes, we'll be glad to do it. So she made a nice fruit basket with candy and apples and bananas and, and all kind of goodies in there. And it was a nice big basket. And, you know, and so it was set up for us to come to my granddaughter's house. And so we went over there and we went into my granddaughter's house. And Susan brought the big, nice basket of fruit and laid it on the uh, table there. And then uh, a little, about two minutes later, the man which lived 
<clears throat> next door, he was in his 50s, and his, one of his relatives, uh, a young woman, she must have been about 30 years old, came with him. So all this is set up by God. All we do is obey and, and flow with it. So they come in and, uh, and, and sit down, and we sit down, and uh, I begin to talk and share with him. And, and he didn't know if his wife was a Christian or not. And uh, I had no knowledge of that either, but I said, well, listen, I want to encourage you just to commit your wife to the Lord and trust her with the Lord. And then I turned the tables on him, and I said, well, brother, you know, I want you to know that God loves you, and God's going to be with you and strengthen you. And by the way, do you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Now, notice how I turn that thing right around, and now I'm zeroing on him. I can't do nothing for her. She's gone. She's in God's hands. I'll let him know that. Trust her to the Lord. But how is it with your soul? He says, you know, when I was young, I accepted Christ years ago. And I say, brother, what do you think about rededicating and committing your life again? He says, I'd like to do that. So I, I shared a little bit of the gospel with him. He, he, he committed his life again to Christ. I had him to go through the sinner's prayer. And he believed in his heart that God raised Christ from the dead. He confessed Christ before us. Now, while we're doing that, this woman over there is about 30 years old sitting down, and she's listening. And she's over there with tears in her eyes, crying. Now, we've had this before in, uh, that had happened uh, at times past. She's over there crying. So when I finished with him and sealed his salvation, and I had him to pray and forgive people and all of that, so then we turned the tables on her. And say, sister, how is it with your soul between you and God? She said, you know, when I was young, my mother shared Jesus with me, and she was a crying. I mean, the Spirit of God was just manifesting himself, and it was hard for her to talk, you know. And I said, well, you know. And then she broke down. She says, well, you know, I was living with this man for years, and we finally got married, you know, and blah, 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 you know. And so we worked with her, got her right with God. She repented. She came back to God. I laid my hands on her. Boom. She went out on the couch. Boom. Now, I didn't plan all of that. That is walking in the path of Jesus as the Holy Spirit leads and opens doors. But we were ready. So now, let's turn the table. Suppose... Susan says, well, listen, why should I make the basket? You make the basket. And Bob and me, we're busy over here. we got plenty to do. We don't need to do that. But see, God's not prepared these vessels for that type of stuff. We are ready 24-7. And how many times in our whole ministry it's been God setting up situations which we could never set up, and we just simply obey God, and God does it. That happens all the time. That's how this land is here, while we got this land. This building's here. This is how we operate. This is how we flow. We walk with Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit. And I can tell you many, many other stories of how we have been led by the Holy Spirit. Now, getting back to our scriptures here, Jesus made it very clear that his own miracles and deeds of power came from the Father, he says, believe me, verse 11, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me or else before me <clears throat> or else believe me for the sake of the very work themselves. If you cannot trust me, at least let these works that I do in my Father's name convince you. Now that's powerful. When you see somebody flowing in the Holy Spirit and you see the works that are coming forth through their lives, it can have great impact on people that see. How did you do this? How, what happened? It was the Holy Spirit that did it. And when they see God working through us, it does, it does something for them. I want you to go over to the next page. This is uh, John uh, 14, the same chapter. 
And uh, let's start with verse 15. Verse 15 now. We're in the same chapter, and we're moving into uh, about the Holy Spirit. Jesus is introducing them now to get a better understanding of the Holy Spirit and who he is. Uh, Verse 15, are we there? All right, 14, 15. Now Jesus is talking to his disciples. He's preparing them and uh, trying to get them ready uh, to understand what's going to happen to him within the next um, 24 hours, I believe you could say. And here's what he's saying to them, and here's what he's really saying to us. If you really love me, you will keep, obey my commands. Now, boy, what a statement that is. Let's let that roll in your mind. Someone says, well, I love the Lord. I say, well, that's good. That's wonderful. What is the proof? And uh, that person would say, well, I keep his commandments. That's almost like James saying, I'll show you my faith by my works. I'm not saved by my works, but I will show you my faith by my works. I will show you my love by my obedience to the commands of Jesus. You will show your love to me by your obedience to God's commands. If you love me, you will keep my commands. That's what Jesus said. Now, how many of you, you know, and it's not to be critical, but we got to tell it like it is. You see people say, I love the Lord, but they're breaking all of God's commands. <laughs> they're breaking all of Jesus' commands. And I have to say, Lord, there are things that we have to judge, not critically, not condemning, but, but judging the fruit. You shall know them. How? Somebody tell me. How? By their love. And if we love God, and also the fruit. So, Jesus is challenging them. He's saying, okay, boys, you say you love me? Keep my commandments. And what I love about it is God has given to these disciples and to us His Holy Spirit to help us, to teach us, to keep the commandments of the Lord and give us the power to keep his commandments. And and that's not hard at all. All right, let's go on. Now, Jesus is saying, now, boys, I'm not going to leave you here all by yourself down here as orphans. This is what I'm going to do in verse 16. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another comforter. All right, who's who's the first comforter? Jesus. But I'm going to give you another comforter. I'm going to go to the Father, but I'm going to give you another comforter. He's going to come. The Father's going to send him. And let me tell you what he's going to do in your life. He will give you another comforter. He will be your counselor. He'll be your helper. He'll be your intercessor. He'll be your advocate. He'll plead your case. He'll be your strengthener. How many times? I have received strength from the Holy Spirit. Now, what I want to do this night, and I want to talk about it in some of the days ahead, how much do you really, and I'm talking to myself too, my wife, how much do we really discern the presence of God, the Holy Spirit living in us, and guiding us and directing us? How much are we really hearing him each day of our life? Now, think it through. You know, no condemnation. Are we aware that he's our helper? Are we aware that he's our counselor? Are we aware that he's our strengthener? Are we aware that he intercedes for us? He's going, he will be our standby, that he may remain with you forever. I love that. Now, when I first became a Christian, I was somewhat aware of God. And when I received Christ as my Savior, I was very aware of Jesus. It was Jesus and me. 
But as I grew in the Lord and read the Scriptures, I realized that Jesus himself is seated at the right-hand side of the Father. But he also lives in our heart through the person of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Now I'll give you something else to, twist, to, 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 to tangle your mind up. Jesus is seated at the right-hand side of the Father, and you and me is seated at the right-hand side of the Father. Now, if that don't blow you out of the stove, nothing will. We accept it all by faith. Try to line it up in your word, in your mind. The Holy Spirit has been given to us. You cannot be born again without the person of the Holy Spirit. He's the one that convicts us of sin. He's the one that shows us that we need a Savior. And then we have to act upon that and receive Christ into our heart so the Holy Spirit lives within us. So we're born again by the incorruptible Word of God and the Holy Spirit regenerating our spirit man, making it alive, and now we are conscious of God, probably more in heaven, but then after a while we become conscious of the other comforter, who is the Holy Spirit, who lives within us, and now we've got to learn to follow him day by day and let him lead us into ministry, let him lead us in everything we do. Folks, I'm here to tell you, I deal with a lot of people. Not many people understand the work of the Holy Spirit. Not many people have a communion with Him in their everyday walk. And I want to try to, through my teaching tonight and, and, and down the road a little bit, to get us so conscious of the Holy Spirit. Because I believe that we are in the last days, and I'm telling you that the Bible says the power is not of these vessels, but the power is of God, and that's the power of the Holy Spirit. Many times you will be directed by the Holy Spirit, and you will not be aware of it. That's amazing. How many times? And then all of a sudden you're aware that the Holy Spirit was directing you all along. How many have ever really experienced that in their lives? And you look back and say, God, I say to Susan, honey, I wasn't really so aware of it, but man, I look back and say, God led us. I mean, he directed us in this thing that we just accomplished, and I'm amazed at that. Now, many times we are aware that we are under the unction of the Holy Spirit, and he is directing, and we are following him, and we see the results that come forth because of that. Now, look at verse 17. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, welcome. Take to its heart, because it does not see him or know and recognize him. But listen to this, what Jesus said. But you know and recognize him, for he lives with you constantly and will be in you. I want everybody to say, Lord, the Holy Spirit lives within me. Good. That's a good start right there. Now, I know a lot of you know this, but uh, I'm, I'm going to tell you what Paul told Timothy. Paul told Timothy, he said to Timothy, Timothy, you will be a good minister if you remind the people of these things. Isn't that amazing? So for me to be a good uh, minister or our other ministers, if they're going to be good ministers, basically what we, they got to do is remind us of many things probably we already know. But we have to be reminded of a lot of these things. Now, let's look at this. Verse 18, I will not leave you as orphans, comfortless, desolate, bereaved, forlorn, helpless. I will come back to you. Now, notice this. I will come back to you in the person of the Holy Spirit. Do you see that? I will come back to you. How? In the person of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God the Father. 
You got that? No, if you read the Bible, it's all in there. Okay. Look at verse 19. Just a little while now, and the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me, because I live, you will live also. Now, can you imagine these disciples? You've got to get into the mind of these disciples. They're really confused. He's going away. He's coming back. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come back. He, the Holy Spirit will live with you. I'll come back with the Holy Spirit. We will live in you. What about the kingdom? <laughs> so he's patient with them, and he, 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 he goes on. Now, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> let's run over to uh, <clears throat> Acts real quick, like. Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. It's up on the board. Let's start with um, verse 6, okay? Verse 6. Now, let's see the setting. He's already been crucified. He's already been buried. He's already rose from the dead. He's walked with them now for 40 days and 40 nights. He showed himself to 500 uh, disciples. He showed himself to the apostles in his resurrected body. And now he's about to ascend into heaven. And in verse 6, so when they were assembled, they asked him. Now remember, he's in his resurrected body here. Lord, is this the time when you will reestablish the kingdom and restore it to Israel. Somebody tell me what's in their mind. <laughs> Do you see it? Now you're going to restore the, the kingdom. The kingdom is going to come, and we're going to set one on your right, one on your left, and that, 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 that. Do you see their minds at this point? Well, we've been there, you know. Now, he says to them, look at verse 7, <clears throat> Gentlemen, uh, boys, uh, it is not for you to become acquainted with and know what time brings the things and events of time and their definite periods uh, or fixed years and seasons, uh, their critical niches in time, uh, which the Father has appointed, fixed, and reserved by his own choice and authority and, and personal power. But now, he says a lot there. So right now, it doesn't mean that maybe later on they might not know. But right at this point, let's get off of that, boys. We're not on that right now. We, we, you got a job you got to do. And let me tell you what we, what's up next on the agenda, okay? The kingdom, just put the kingdom a little bit further in the future, okay? But let's concentrate on the now. Let me tell you what we got planned for you right now, okay? All right. Then he says something in verse 8. Look at verse 8. But you shall receive power, ability. That's what power is. Power is the ability or the efficiency and the might to accomplish what God gives us to accomplish. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends and the very bounds of the earth. So he hears... You know, he hears them. Uh, the disciples hear Jesus. Now, when he had said this, even as they were looking at him, he was caught up, and a cloud received and carried him away out of their sight. Well, oh, what an experience that must be. Did you see that, Philip? John, was you looking? Willie, did you see that? Mike? Wow. Where's he going? Don't you remember he says he's going up there to prepare a place for us? Yeah, but what are we going to do down here? Don't you remember? He says, now wait. Just hold study. The Holy Spirit's going to come. He's going to come upon you and give you power and the ability to do something. But what does he want us to do? Well, I think he said something about being a witness, didn't he? Yeah, being a witness. Now, Jesus is going up, okay? And by the way, when you read Matthew... Uh, some of them still doubt it. <laughs> I mean, he's going up into the clouds, and they're still doubting. 
So don't be too hard on yourself, okay? <laughs> All right. Look at verse 9. And when he had said this, that is when Christ said this, even as they were looking at him, he was caught up, and a cloud received and carried him away out of their sight. And while they were gazing, they're, they're up there gazing. Philip, he's gone. Thomas, he's gone. He's left us. But don't you remember, he said he's going to send the other comforter. He's not going to leave you down here as orphans. He's going to send the comforter. Well, I sure need some comfort about right now. Where's our Lord gone? He's gone. He's out of sight. So you got to get you got to get the human element in there. And don't think that these people are some it on the stick. <laughs> some big dudes. Listen, they were fishermen. Poor folks. You know, Paul talks to the Corinthians. He says, look among you. Not many uh, 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 that's among you are noble and prince and big shots. No. Look among you. God takes the simple things, the things that the world hates and uses to confound the wise of this world. So you've got to know how the Holy Spirit works. You've got to know how. People like you and me is the people that God uses in his kingdom. Where are the educated? Mike's, he's one of them. Willie's pretty educated, I think. The rest of us, just folks. Linda's very highly educated, high educated. Paul was, the apostle Paul was very, but you know what he said? All of that has become dunk. <laughs> Dunky dunk dunk. He realized that God will take something the world considers ridiculous and make an apostle or a disciple or a believer out of that person. You read that in 1 Corinthians. Paul pretty covers that, covers that pretty well in 1 Corinthians. But let's get back to this scene now. We see the scene. And while they were, verse 10, gazing intensely, into heaven as he went, be behold, two men dressed in white robes suddenly stood beside them. Two men, two men. What were these men? Angels. You know, years ago, I don't know, some of you may remember this, but I remember it way back in uh, even the late 30s and the early 40s. I don't want to call them bums. What should I call them? How many remember? They, they just certain they would come around. All of a sudden, somebody would be knocking on your door, and there's a guy standing out there with his hat off and wanting to know, could I do some work for some food? Have you ever ever experienced that? None of you, none of you have experienced that. Okay. Well, that's what happened way back uh, in the, during the Depression time and doing and, and during the war. And the Bible says, you never know, they might be angels. For many entertained men not knowing that they were angels. And I, th I thought about my grandmother would fix a meal for them and, 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 and just feed them, and then they would just go on somewhere else. So I forget what they call them. They called them, some people called them different names, but... but the experience that Susan and me had the time on Meadowcliff Avenue when I was up there fixing the roof. And I was just, the way the roof was, you had to turn the shingles a certain way to start it another way, like this, and you'd come like this. And I just could not figure that out. This Cadillac pulls up in the front yard. This was on Meadowcliff Avenue. Myself and a, one of my men, one of the men that was helping me, young boy. <coughs> this guy, he's dressed, he's tall, big, strong, jumped on the ladder, comes up and says, you got a little problem here, don't you? And I said, well, yes, sir. I said, I can't figure out how to, you know, let me, let me have your apron. 
He put the apron on. I gave him the hammer. He, he went down there and took some shingles and got it fixed for me. He said, I think that'll, that'll, that you're okay now. You can go with that. I said, gee whiz, thank you. Susan was seeing what was going on, so she comes out. He comes down off the ladder. Can I write you out a check? Oh, no, no problem. Gets back in his Cadillac, backs up, and drives away. Never seen him again. Now, how did he know I was having a problem up there? You know, you can, if you analyze that and say, wait a minute, we're up there, we're working. How does he know we're having a problem up that, there? He pulls in the yard. He comes up and says, you're having a problem. And I could have said, well, how do you know? How did he know? He's supernatural. Angels know things that we don't know. So we knew within us after that, the Holy Spirit bared witness that was an angel. And that was exciting. So in your life, think back. How many angels ever came to your house? How many angels intervened in your life in certain situations? If we don't stop, if we're so... And I don't say this to be, and I say that I put myself in the same pot. We could be so earthly minded that we're not aware of the angels of God and even the demonic powers in the atmosphere. One of the biggest jobs that we have as a church is to tear down the enemy in the, in the atmosphere that's creating all the problems on the earth. Hello? That's why I spent a certain amount of time under the unction of the Holy Spirit binding principalities and powers in the heavenlies. That's where the war is won. The people on the earth are puppets. And these spirits are directed and guiding them and, and causing them to do all kind of things. We just had uh, somebody testify uh, Sunday, if you caught it. I picked those things up just like that because, I, because in the spirit I can see. She didn't know why she was mad at a certain person. I mean, remember that, that woman standing there sharing that. Anybody remember that one? The rest of you don't remember. <laughs> Miracles are happening right in front of your eyes, and we don't look and see and discern. You, don't know, you won't know they're miracles. Did you know an a spirit, evil spirit came out of this man that I prayed for Sunday? How many saw that? An evil spirit came out of that person. See? It's just like, the, like it's natural. No, it's supernatural. And yet, if you're not careful, if you don't discern, you'll think, you know. And, 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 of course, I knew she looked over to her left, and I knew who she was aggravated with for a long time. <laughs> okay. Hello. <laughs> All right. <laughs> a lot happened Sunday, believe me. All right, now we're getting familiar with the Holy Spirit and see that He's our comforter, our helper, our counselor. He'll show us things yet to come. He will teach us. When I read this Bible, verse by verse, I say, Holy Spirit, help me, and I tear every verse down and make sure I understand it and broaden it out and get the understanding of it but I lean totally on the Holy Spirit to teach me this word. I've always done that. And God has taught me this word. And when he teaches you the word, let me tell you something. It is quickened by his Holy Spirit and it quickens your spirit and you sense the power of it. And it's shouting. I see Susan me sometimes at the house. Shouting. I mean, the, the, the revelation of the word is so strong that, that it, it pierces our spirit and we, we receive the energy and the power of the word. Because Jesus said, my word is spirit and what? Life. And, and that's when you know the Holy Spirit's operating in your, in your life. You didn't figure it out in your own thinking. The Holy Spirit showed it to you. It, he quickened it to you. And now you build, you're building that relationship with the Holy Spirit and you are conscious of Him every moment of the day. All right. You're here to learn. And I want you to... I, I, oh, I got so much I want to share, but I'm going to be calm. 
Here we go. Let's read verse 10 again. And while they were gazing intensively into heaven, as he went, behold, two men dressed in white robes suddenly stood beside them. I like that. Suddenly. Boom. God is a suddenly God. Suddenly. I love it. Suddenly. It can be in church. Suddenly it could be in your car. Suddenly it could be in the bathroom. Suddenly it can be while you're riding the lawnmower. Suddenly you see it in your mind. Years ago, and, and, and Frank remembers this, Canaan Baptist Church, I had a dream. And this, uh, I saw the, the church building, and this big monstrous cloud was over at Canaan Baptist Church, all black, with a black face. It was, it was a big monster hovering over that church. And God was teaching me intercessory praying at that time. He was teaching me, Bob, the war is not with flesh and blood down here. It's up in the heavenlies. You're seated in the heavenlies, Bob. Church, you're seated in the heavenlies, and from there... The enemy power is in the second heaven and he's controlling all the people down here that's his and trying to control the church just like a, a, a puppet. And the church has to realize we are the spiritual people of God. We're the heavenly people of God. We are seated with Christ in heavenly places having the power of the Holy Spirit in us and we are to come down and charge these powers, and fight them in the name of Jesus. Why did God give us weapons? They're mighty through God to the tearing down of strongholds in the heavenlies, and then you'll see in the natural things clear up. You must understand that, and if you're praying, now my name, and down to sleep, and I praise the Lord, but so to keep. I love you, but stop that. That's foolishness. Mount up with the weapons that God has given to you. Take charge. Use the authority that God's given to you and start tearing those principalities and powers down. Okay? Now, I was new in spiritual warfare. So I start charging with my weapons. Now, if you notice in Ephesians 6, the one weapon that's, that, that's powerful, the other armaments are to protect us. There's a weapon that, that's powerful. It's the Word of God, which is the sword of the Spirit. So when we sp speak the Word of God against principalities and powers, we actually give the Holy Spirit, who lives within us, the sword of the Spirit, and He does the cutting and defeats the enemy as we provide the Word, which becomes a sword in His hand, that does uh, harm to the enemy. It's spiritual. And until you can understand that, then our logical minds will just stay on the logical part of uh, the earth. But when you can see... Now, God allowed me to see this stronghold. There's strongholds over churches. There's strongholds over families. There's strongholds over individuals. There's strongholds perhaps maybe over some of you and you're not aware of, and you'll never get the victory from them until you learn spiritual warfare. You have to mount up in the Spirit, and you have to speak and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. It is written, you will not dominate and control me. You will not. Harass me any longer. I break your power. I bind you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Now you've got to remember, you've got power in you. The Word of God is powerful. It's like that two-edged sword. And you're cutting the enemy, and he can only take so much of that. And as you keep pounding him, he's going to leave. Now, here's what I've learned about the enemy. Through the teaching of the Holy Spirit. He may leave you alone for two weeks. He says, I think I'll go back and harass Susan a little bit. And the minute she discerns by the Spirit, discernment, one of the gifts of the Spirit, this Spirit is back harassing me, 
How many times our grandchildren have come in, we knew that it was spiritual. They were being harassed by the enemy. We'd put them in the hot chair, and we'd take authority over that enemy, and we say, you loosen my grandchild right now in the name of Jesus. Now, we learned that through the precious Holy Spirit and the Word of God. And they, gosh, they're free. The heaviness is gone. The bondage is gone. The fear is gone. But it took spiritual power against spiritual beings. Okay? All right. How many times? I just love it. <coughs> There's times when the Holy Spirit will come on me. I don't know if you've ever experienced that. I'm sure some of you have. I know Frank has. Some of you probably have. Susan has, I know. There's times when he'll, he'll rise up in you. There was a, a woman years ago when we lived on Meadowcliff Avenue, and she would come to our house and we would minister to her and we would teach her how to do spiritual warfare. But after a while, she just liked the attention that we were giving her. Okay? Hello? All right. <laughs> it's not too bad. You don't think a little bit of yourself sometimes. <laughs> but you can't go on that way. She'd come in, she'd flop on the couch and have her pity party right on our couch and all. And Susan to start with, you know, well, you know, get you in a hot chair, pray it in hallelujah and and then she would leave the house, she'd be okay, but she loved that attention. So the Holy Spirit showed Susan, she's, she's delivered. She just don't want to rise up. Apathy is upon her. Pastivity is upon her. She likes the attention she's getting from you and Bob. Holy Spirit showed Susan that. So she comes to the house and she's having one of those little pity party things, you know. And the Holy Ghost came upon Susan. And out of her mouth said, Young lady, you stand up and you take authority over that enemy right now. You quit this baby stuff. You become a woman. Get back to your house. Be the wife you ought to be. Love your husband. Tell the enemy to go to hell and get with it. And that woman jumped up. Woo! Man, it just hit her and she knew it was the truth. And she repented and went back to her home and did what she's supposed to do. How I love Jesus. Folks, I'm telling you, I know some of you know this. And I'll mention Frank. Frank and me learned our spiritual warfare. If we didn't fight, we knew we were going to go down, right, Frank? <laughs> and brother, that'll toughen you up. You've just got to get up and you've got to get, uh, just say, Holy Ghost, whatever it takes, use me to beat this enemy. Now, one thing that I've learned, I don't go around beating the enemy every day, but I have enough sense, periodically, anything that bothered me years ago, every once in a while I'll come up against that spirit because they'll try to come back. If you're, if you're greedy, it's either the devil or the flesh. It's simple. It's not complicated. What else could it be? Come on, church. It's simple. It ain't complicated. Father, I thank you that I'm dead indeed under greedy. And if any greedy spirits around me or in me, I command them in the name of Jesus. Come out of me. Go. Leave right now. Well, I just couldn't do that, Pastor Bob. I'm just so tender and sweet. So I'll come into your house, and I'm hauling your TV out. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at your refrigerator, and I'm getting all the goodies out. It wouldn't take you but about 30 seconds. I would feel this thing somewhere back there. woo -hoo! 
Come on, church. Come on. Is that not right? we got to understand that we're spirit beings. We fight principalities and powers in the atmosphere. It's time for the church to rise up and do what they designed to do. Our weapons are mighty through God to the tearing down of strongholds. Our weapons. Why did God give us weapons? Because we are in a battle and most of the church don't even know it. Oh, how I love Jesus. I love those. I love that song. And I know most of you know what I'm talking about. But see, I'm being a good minister, and I'm reminding you of these things. When's the last time? Now, be honest. The last time you did any spiritual warfare against the enemy powers of darkness, or have you ever did it in your life? You know I love you. The Holy Spirit has the power. You have the power. The ability, that's what power is. The ability, the efficiency, and the weapons to do spiritual warfare. But you just cannot just do it once in a while. You know, of course, none of you all have this problem, but every once in a while, you'll see a roach around the house. How many has ever seen a a roach around your house. Come on. How many of you know if you don't do something, your whole house will be taken over by those roaches? So you get your weapons, and you go around and you spray. But you got to spray again next week. If they, if they have really taken hold, you just can't spray one time and figure the whole house is clear of roaches. You may have to spray... Once a week for two or three months until you know that those roaches are gone. Is that not true? And that's the same way it is with spiritual warfare. I've seen people in such passivity that they've been taken over by the enemy. And, 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 and I try to teach them spiritual warfare. And they say, shoot, devil. Who? Go in Jesus' name. Go. They do it one time and figure and the devil don't seem to move. No, you've got to toughen up, saint. You've got to take the weapons. It's war. War is hell. You've got to rise up, mama. You've got to rise up, daddy. You've got to rise up, children. That's a spiritual warfare. You're going down if you don't learn to fight. Come on, love me a little bit, just a little bit. I've seen many families, they never taught their children about the enemy. Now, I don't say we have to talk about him all day long, but you've got to do a certain amount of spiritual warfare. You've got to take those weapons, which are mighty, to the tearing down of strongholds. And these spirits are all in the atmosphere. You can go to a city. I can, my wife and me can go to a house, and we can discern like that if there's bickering and biting in that house. Hello? Or the peace of God, or God is in that house. Peace is in that house. If there's bigger than biting between the, two, the, 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 the couples, we pick it up like that. Not that we're smart. That's just the way the Holy Spirit does. He lives within us, and when we're conscious of His movements, when we're conscious of His discernment, we discern it. It's not about our brains, it's a matter of spiritual discernment. Your spirit man has developed to that point. We had a couple, all right, I'm going to let you go, it's that time, but I'm going to say that I'll let you go. Had this couple that got in this house, and, and the cabinet doors open at night. Bob, can you come over? What's wrong? Well, the cabinet doors is open and shut. We're trying to go to sleep, and the cabinets are just open and shut. So we knew what it was, you know, before they moved in that house. They were probably all kind of occult activities, demon powers was operating in that house. We went over there. The doors are opening and shutting. We took authority. We pleaded the blood. We took our weapons. We're mighty through God. We tore down those spirits of darkness, and then we commanded them to go, and those, those doors never opened again. We were sitting at a table 
talking to this woman, and the demon began to choke, the, choke her. What would you do? What would you have done Sunday? You'd take authority. We took authority. And, and, and she was about turning purple. We, we commanded that spirit to loosen her in the name of Jesus. Susan and me, that devil left. She never had no more trouble again. So we are fighting, but the Holy Spirit's been given to us for a reason. Yes, to comfort us, but to teach us how to do spiritual warfare and to, and, and to go forward. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you now.